If you think about Cisco as a company, Cisco wants to grow their business mid-teens. That's what we tell the analysts, right? We want to grow our business annually mid-teens. You know, that was kind of easy to do when we were only doing a billion dollars worth of business. I can remember a national sales meeting one time when Cisco was talking about because we were growing our business mid 40% year over year. You talking about some surprise on your numbers when you got them the next year? Yeah, they were going up 40%. They were taking good accounts away from you and next thing you know your number's 40% bigger. But we killed it. We killed it. We were growing our company that big. So guess what? Cisco was doing all that as a small company, but when you get bigger, it's harder to do that. So now we're telling analysts, where are we trying to grow our business? Mid-teens at best, low-teens, mid-teens. Well, it's hard to do that when, heck, 50 per, over 50% of our revenue is in routing and switching, and we dominate those, and the market doesn't grow that fast. We've got... You know, if you've got revenue, let me do revenue and market share here, we're dominant players here. We get great revenue, it's way up here. But how fast can that grow? Sometimes it shrinks. Switches have been shrinking 2% annually. Switch sales. We've been holding our own with that. Overall, switches are, switch sales are actually shrinking. So guess what? We can't change our number with that. We have to change our number with the thing that's in here, the advanced technologies. What we used to call the advanced technologies. The thing that's a billion dollar business or better for Cisco. So let's just think about wireless LAN. Can we grow our business on wireless LAN? Oh yes. It's a great gr growing opportunity. But it's probably not going to drive our overall number of over 40 billion dollars, that 10%, 12%, 14% we want to. But it can help. You know, we are 50% of the market, and if the market's growing, we can grow abnormally more than that. We want our unfair share of that. So certainly, we might be able to grow a little bit. Security. Video. All these things are things that are in there that we, we play really well. It might be a growing market, but overall, we still can't grow our whole number the way the analysts might want us to be to, to keep our stock price where it's at. So we have to launch new bubbles. <laughs> we have to get new things out there. The MDS 9500 was a new bubble. It was revenue that we would never had opportunity to get until we gave this new product out. With that new product, we launched out storage area networking, SAN. Now, it, you know, we've invested 60, 70, 80 million dollars in it, and eventually it started growing after we got it out. It started growing to, you know, maybe a 400, a 400 million dollar market. After it comes so up, we'll just put it in there and say SAN is a part of our advanced technologies and part of that bubble. We can grow that and everything. This is new money for us, right? Data center switching. And it was in a huge market, a huge fast market, fast growing market, and there was a great demand for it. So we accelerated what we did. So in a matter of, it just seemed like every month we were coming up with something different. Nexus 7,000, Nexus 5,000, Nexus 2,000, <laughs> Nexus 1,000. Not even a switch, it's software. That bubbles up into here to grow our business because we have to. Eventually we said we, we need to attack another market. There's another opportunity for us there. There's a different type of server out here. There's a different type of server out in the networks. We have these standalone servers and everything and virtualization is doing really good. But there's a different type of server out there. This different, different type of server, and I'm going to turn this this way so you folks can see. Can you see this over here? Can you, see, can you folks see it? The different type of server is a blade server. Because you know, they made a liar out of me. I kept saying, a server is a server is a server. It's commoditized. Who cares about servers? I wasn't selling them, so I wasn't putting money in my pocket. I could say anything I want to them about. But Cisco said, now that we're virtualizing, blade servers are a little bit different. The typical blade server chassis had what? It had 
Well, it had two power supplies for redundancy. It had a management module in it to manage the servers inside of there. It had Ethernet connectivity. Cisco actually used to sell catalyst switch ports that would go in that for IBM and HP and Dell and everybody else. It would have uh, HBAs inside of it. And then you would buy server blades that went in there. You could maybe get one through 12 server blades in there. The value of this is, is I could get more servers per rack unit with the blade servers than I could if I bought standalone. That was the benefit of it. Each one of these blades had processing and RAM on it. It used the power supply and the Ethernet NIC cards from all these other things. So it was a chassis. That's all it was. The thing about it is, is when virtualization came in, this thing had some holes in it too. You had the processing, so now I start getting four cores here and four cores here. I'm running one application on it. It's only running 10 or 15 percent utilization. I want to run VMware on it. So guess what? I take a couple of cores, run one application on it. The problem is, is this thing only had 96 gigabyte of RAM available on it because of the way they had been building these things over and over. Been enough for just one application, 96 gig is plenty. But if I'm running multiple applications on it, that goes away quick. Let's say my first application needs 48, my second application needs 24, my third application needs 32. Uh-oh, I'm already up. I, even with simple math, that's wrong. Cisco said this is an opportunity for us to go back to zero and build a blade server like it was built for virtualization, and that's what we did. That's where the B series chassis. Why did Cisco do this? Blade servers were a $37 billion market opportunity. New money that Cisco had never had a chance to get. We needed a new bubble, the UCS bubble. If we could just in a couple of years get 10% of that market. How much new money is that into Cisco? 3.7 billion dollars of new money. Could we use that to grow our business? That's a significant amount. Does this make sense? This is why Cisco does all this stuff, man. It's, it's, we've got to get new money. We've got to find some place where we can, if we can't grow the markets, we're getting new ones. Where we can make a difference, and this is a place where we could make a difference. Because we had a way of doing it. So let's look and see what we did with the B-series. Hey, is that R&D here in San Jose? Or it yeah, it's, it's uh, we incubate more on this campus than anybody ever knows. Uh, most of the incubation is there here, yes. Not to say all of it is, but most of it is. So let's just think about this. Cisco said, let's think about, we need a lot of RAM. We need a lot of RAM in our blades. We're going to have, we'd like to think about it, one management point for 12 servers. If we could do better than that, that'd be cool too. So our requirements of to, to differentiate ourselves in this, uh, in this market came out. So what Cisco came out with was kind of a lot different. A big chassis, a big solid metal chassis, the 5108 chassis. It's just a big metal housing with connectors in it. Inside of that, we're going to put the ability to have eight half-wide servers in here. So this is where our servers will go into. That's why they call it a 5108, because there's eight slots here, maximum of eight servers. We're going to put some you know, power supplies in this thing, in there. And, that, and this is just bare metal. Our smarts that we want to use, we're going to actually put them outside of this box. We're actually going to have two boxes on top here called Fabric Interconnects. The Fabric Interconnects 
have our management platform. It's got our management platform in there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But there's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have, it's going to be a little different than what traditionally was out there. So I can put my server inside of here. Now on the back side of this, I'll do it in like this. We're going to have connections from here to there. We're going to have 10 gigabit connections. We're going to have the ability to have eight 10 gigabit connections. Small b, any. Eight 10 gigabit connections up here. So we'll take eight, uh, the possibility of eight 10 here, eight up to this guy. So I'm going to have the ability to have 160 gigabyte of connectivity into, in and out of this one chassis. Out of this one chassis. And inside of each one of these connectors here is going to be Ethernet that will go out this way to the user. So the user can get in and out and it's going to have fiber channel over Ethernet that will come up and go out to the storage area network. So we're going to have unified cabling. One cable is going to carry all of that stuff for our servers. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can actually do fiber channel straight out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Does this make sense? This is what Cisco came up with. And the cool part of this is, is so when you buy it, you or buy your servers here. Now again, the problem with these servers, these blade servers, ended up being the memory issue. So Cisco went to Intel and said, hey, listen, we can build some ASICs here. And we got some ideas about this. Typical memory into a processor, let me do this in green. So if you've got a processor here, it's going to be able to see memory coming, RAM memory coming in, in these, this, these DIMMs, right? It's memory you put in there. And it can only see it, see four of those, which is limiting us over there. Cisco said, can I cheat this and will you support it? And they said, cheat this? How do you mean? What I want to do is I want to build an ASIC here that makes this guy C4 DIMMs, but I want to put four times that on here. I want to be able to represent 384 gigabytes of RAM back into your processors if I build this chip. Intel said, that's kind of cool. <laughs> And we'll support it. <laughs> this is called extended memory technology. And it's the first thing that we did, kind of cool, to get our name out there. It's the very first thing that we did. What does this mean? It means you could virtualize more applications on our blades that required a lot of memory than anybody else at the time. Now, it was a short win, short-term win, but it got our name out there and customers started looking at this. At least they were considering us. At least they were considering us. But we had other benefits that I think are even more, more attractive. Remember I told you that we had been working with VMware. We were actually part owners of VMware. And we've been in there looking in their labs at things they were doing. And Cisco said, you know what? There's some really cool things that you'd like to do VMware. Did you know VMware used to be in the, uh, is in the switching business, even before they acquired this other company? They actually, if you think about it, if I run multiple servers on here, I'm going to have multiple NIC cards, multiple VLANs, all this, that, and the other. So VMware figured out that they needed a software switch on their hypervisor software in order to be able to do that, to do all the QoS and things like that. Well, when Cisco went in there and said, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, we're trying to work out this software switch thing and we're not really good at it. Cisco looked at him and said, why don't you let me take care of that? I'll do that for you. I'm good at switching. I know how to do that. So Cisco actually came up 
with software called the 1000V, the Nexus 1000V, which is a software switch that does all of that for you. Matter of fact, if you buy the Enterprise, the large highest end, it comes in, in all the VMware inside of that. Why? So we can do QoS on these multiple machines. We can do all kinds of cool things that I'll show you in there. We, our core competency was switching. Even in software, we could do it better than VMware could because they, that's not their core competency. So Cisco actually created the 1000V software switch. They also said, our interface here, we're not, our management's not going to just manage one of these chassis. It can manage more. So if a customer buys one chassis, one, these fabric interconnects, and wants to expand and have more, they buy another chassis here, a 5108 chassis. They put the servers inside of it. And then they run that up here to these guys. What if one management point for 20 of these chassis. For 20 of these chassis. 20 times 8, that's 160. You can manage 160 servers instead of 12 at one management interface. That's what Cisco did. Customers like that too. Less management interfaces, easier to manage and all that. We also said, found out, and this is, I'm sure it was hard for Cisco to do this, to say, when we design our management, we do not need, we do not need, we can't be the lead. You know, when you go dancing, I'm not a bit very good dancer. But you know what? I've learned enough. Two people can't lead when you're on a dance floor. You step on each other's toes and it looks pretty stupid when you're out there, by the way. Guess what? We know that VMware is going to be the lead in the data center because they know what's going on with the application. They actually know the performance of the application, all the important stuff about the application. So we're going to design our management to be subservient to VMware, but give them a lot of information. And by the way, we'd like to make it to where instead of having all these management points, you could use our managements for servers and actually make a server profile inside of our, our uh, management that has three distinct values. I'll have my IT organization put all the MAC addresses and VLAN information, all the networking stuff in this software. And then somebody from the storage, the SAN group can come in and in the same software the same application could put their information in. And then the application guys can come in here and tell us all about their application characteristics. We can put all, everything that used to, it's like 61 different characteristics, 61 or 62 characteristics that used to take three separate management platforms to find out everything about in one. We can make something called a server profile that is one pane of glass that has everything about that server that we need to be able to move it anywhere we want to. And customers love that. What's that mean? That means with, within 20 of these chassis, if I have a virtual machine running right there, I can move it anywhere on any of these other 20 chassis in the same management plane anytime I want, any way I want. Just like that. And who tells us to do it? Not Cisco. VMware does. We let VMware tell us where to move. They say, we, you know, it might be a time of day thing. You know, up and, you know, from 12 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning, we're running our application on two core processors and 24 gig of RAM. But guess what? 8 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning, so a lot of people start coming in. My utilization goes up, my use. My application says, I need more help. We can move it over here into this because we've got four, you know, eight cores and 64 gig of RAM. The same bang, put it there. Do you think customers would like that? Yes, sir. How is that unique to Cisco? How is that unique to Cisco? It was designed for, designed to do this. Customers love this. This is still unique to Cisco. This is still unique to Cisco, this management interface.
No, 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 sorry. The, the ability to move a virtual machine anywhere in your oh, that's what VMware server does. environment. That's what VMware does, but it's how easy it is to manage this in this management plane of ours. Totally unique. But uh, we could do it on a, on a physical level also with the service plus clients. Yeah. If we were to upgrade a two CPU machine, yeah. which has got a yes. service profile, yes. and it's supposed to, let's say it's running an SAP pro, uh, running as an SAP production server, it needs more computing capacity. Yeah. On a two from a two CPU machine, you can move the service profile to a four CPU machine seamlessly, which typically takes about hours or days. To yeah. Be in a traditional world, it might take hours or days to move this. We can do it in a matter of seconds. A matter of seconds. Yes. I mean. Well, I mean, I, I guess I've missed the point about what's different about the system offering. Well, I think if maybe I can add something. Yeah. That might, I just want to validate. Yeah. It's true that you can take a server profile and apply it to a slot, not just to a server. So right, yeah. You can set a slot to have that particular profile, mm -hmm. and then once you buy the server, you just plug it in, it, it will inherit what the slot has. But you, but you can do that if I today. You can can do that, actually. Yeah, just, it's been doing it for a long time. HP has been doing it for a long time. IBM did it for IBM a long too, time. Yeah, I mean, Virtual so connect. I'm really trying to understand the differentiator here, right? Because, you know, if we're telling people for the first time this, they're seeing this, mm -hmm. we make sure we start to call out the things that. Yeah, I think um, one of the differentiators is you have one manage, one yeah, yeah, that has to manage all of this. That's yeah. right. Instead that's right. of having one per chassis that HP would have. So that would be kind of the major differentiator. Okay. I think uh, scalability is another one in terms of how much. Uh, you know, VMs you can support on a certain yeah. server. Yeah, guys, one, one, one adds. If you see that here is a three characteristics that as you draw it, and what's the differentiator maybe you add to this, that then you move the virtual machine, there is no, not new, yeah? As VMware can do it before, but when you move it, you move, you change the characteristics of uh, networking and the storage area network, so, you do not need to, you know, if you just move it with HP. Yeah. Yeah. So to the new new hardware, you you've got a new MAC address and new VSAN address. Because physically those adapters are different. So you should now we can reprogram. So yeah. those three elements all come with it. Yeah. All three sure. elements go at the same time. So your MAC addresses are still the same. Yeah. Your IP addresses are still the same. Everything is exactly the same. Everything. So it's, yeah. it's much, much, much easier. You can do this right now. No, but IBM's doing it, and they do the group out virtual MAC addresses, and they, they have a whole table, and you can do it across a set of chassis. Mm -hmm. It may have been new when Cisco brought it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Again, we're, we're driving this, but we drove them to do this, right? And again, it took somebody from the outside going in. So if I was talking to a customer about this, I'd say, well, guess what? Cisco saw innovation here, innovation that wasn't happening with your traditional vendors, because they were certainly happy to just recycle the servers over and over and over. Who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? But Cisco came in and said, if it, we had, why? And, and it goes back to the same thing with IP telephony. Nortel and Avaya had an opportunity to do IP telephony before Cisco did. Why didn't they do it? Before any of this happened, why didn't they do it? They didn't we eat their own young. And when they when they it was a cash cow. Yeah, they had they if they wanted to do a change, they had to drag a whole bunch of already installed stuff. Why did Cisco do IP telephony? They said if we start if you started this and wanted to do it as an application in 1999, if you could wipe the slate clean and start it, how would you deploy it? Exactly like Cisco did. That's the exact same thing we did there. If you, because the design of the HP and IBM and all those servers up to that point, they had been designed for this and the traditional this. When VMware came, it changed the game. Cisco was clean. They had a clean slate. It's easier to draw a pretty picture on, hang on a second, on this piece of paper than on this piece of paper. <laughs> Right? The benefit here is that Cisco is a better innovator or that it's above the market today? I'm saying this, Cisco innovated in a place where it, was, it would be a yeah, lot more difficult for HP to innovate. I get that, but that's, yeah. that's, that's history. And that we did that. Yes. We did that today, 
Is what? This, is this, because if I said to someone, Cisco did this or Cisco did that, they go, well, so what? Well, what are you doing for me now? First of all, and I'll show you where we're doing that. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. But, but I've got to show you what were the innovations in, in order. I can't show them all to you at once, right? But we all agree that extended memory technology for about six to eight months when nobody else had it. Do we all agree that on a single blade, Cisco was the only person to give you four sockets on a blade, on a blade server, that nobody else could? Nobody else could do that. Four sockets, no. All these were two. Cisco could give you four. Yeah. And, and again, I'm not saying you didn't catch, they didn't catch up or change and everything, but did they lead the way? Who do you, Mr. Customer, want to go with? Somebody who's sitting there happy to just take your money or somebody who will enter the market and innovate it for you? That's the conversation I would have with historical value of this. That's what I would say. But Cisco entered this market. And why did Cisco do it? Again, we did it for our own good, our own new bubble. But we came into a market that was ripe for innovation. Ripe for innovation. So again, all of this stuff worked really well and we start doing it. And again, I think our server profiles are still a very, very viable asset because you move everything everywhere. It's one pane of glass to put everything in. And it's designed specifically to be subservient with VMware and all this, that, and the other, yes. It gives us a very, very good story. But we want to do more. <laughs> Cisco wants to do more. Remember that Nexus? Those Nexus switches and stuff? Again, let's go back to the network. It's where we're best at, in theory. What the, if customers were wanting to do that and had multiple data centers in places, maybe we wanted to start consolidating data centers or actually using data centers. Think about it. If I've got a data center over here, a server running an application in this side, in this data center, and let's say this data center is in LA, and I had another data center in Phoenix, Arizona, out in the desert. Nice place to be, actually. And I had some hardware here. Would it be easy to move that same, let's say its IP address is 10, 10, 10, 6. Would it be easy to move 10, 10, 10, 6 all the way across and make it pop out over here? Absolutely not. Think about my... And by the way, there's another server setting right beside of it that's 10, 10, 10, 7 running the same application. And they have to talk to each other on the same subnet. Ooh. When, the, when this server starts grabbing some database, he actually sends a broadcast out and says, I'm grabbing this database. So they know how to share that database so it stays valid. Wow. That was a challenge, but Cisco wanted to accept that challenge and do that. So what Cisco did, you know, we would connect these guys up, and we'll talk more about, into the 2Ks. We created a, a fan-out switch called a 2K. It answers to the 5K, which answers to a 7K switch. And what we did is we create, they created a whole new technology, a whole new way of doing things called OTV. Overlay to transfer, transport virtualization to where you can actually move that server all the way over here with this same IP address. And when he sends a broadcast to that server over there in a totally different area, we will encapsulate it and know where it's at and release it over here so this guy still thinks it's over here. We can take 16 data centers and make them look like one this way. Do you think that customers would like that? That means that you're not only saying I can move a server in any of this architecture infrastructure here, limited to only 20 of these chassis, but now I'm saying I could put it in any of 16 data centers and move it over here and still have them work. Yes? 
talk later on this. They will be coming out in the next release. Okay, so we have a generation ahead of even <coughs> ten years doing this. Eddie, what happens to the application's data? Well, it's going to be replicated in both places, right? It's going to be replicated in both places. That's what EMC and all those guys do. You're going to have an array here, and you're going to have an array here, and it's the software that will make the data work. So let's say you've got the data in both places, and you move a machine from one physical server to a physical server in a different data center. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the application, you know, operating system instance that you're now using the other storage array, which won't look the same? We could actually we move the. the we could actually use the same storage over here if we wanted to. Well, yeah, probably wouldn't. You'd probably want to do it here. Yeah, that's what I was. But it's the software with the server vendors that deal with that. It's not Cisco that does. I don't know the deep parts of it, so that that'd be a good question for your PSS. Okay. Yeah. I'm about as deep as I'll go right there. <laughs> does this make sense? Oh, there certainly would be delay and distance and all this. This is going to have to be high-speed fiber optic connections and all this, that, and the other. But What's the use case for this functionality? Why would customers want to do it? Why would customers want to do it? Let me give you an example. Hurricane Sandy hits New Jersey. How would you like to have your data center in the middle of the country instead of on a coast where it gets destroyed? How fast could I get it there? Really quick. Same IP addresses, same everything. Right. And I, guess what? I could start doing this. I could say, well, I don't know if Sandy's really going to hit us. Let me just move half of my servers over there and wait and see. I can move half of my servers there, wait and see. And then when it does happen, I can move the other servers out. Because I might have to actually, you know, if I don't have 100% of the server utilization here that I need or server capacity I need, I move half of it here. And then, then I have to start prioritizing which server blade do I use for what application. But at least it gives you what you need. So I figured that that might have been in this case. So mm. that, that's why I asked about mm. that yeah. storage. It's making 16, yeah, I, I, and I don't know how they do that in the back end. I really don't. And again, I, I'm, I'm not a PSS with that. Let's take an example. Uh, an organization has got multiple data centers. And the single administrator wants to see what's happening in the other data center, whether the utilization is proper there or not. In case he finds that the utilization of the resources is, is not up to the up to the mark, he can seamlessly move the machines here. So from a management perspective, this kind of gives, gives a lot of flexibility to the administrators. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it, it, it takes away limitations. And, and I know that people are using this. I don't know exactly that what you're no, you're doing down there. So you you'll have PSSs who can tell you everything about that. I've gone to my limit of my expertise here. And, you know, man's got to know his limitations. Clint Eastwood said that. So, does this make sense? Cisco has done this in a very, very, very short period of time. Think about it. When did we introduce switches? I mean, uh, servers? 2009. Yeah, 2009. Wow. 2009 we did this. In a very short period of time. Has Cisco been an innovator here? Whoa, we've been leading the pack. Yes, sir. It is. Yeah. It's number. It's number two in North America, yeah. so it is number one in Australia. Yeah. In fact, if you do, I, I was attending one. Uh, the cost, if you do simple mathematics, the number of customers that we have acquired is some seventeen thousand customers. Mm -hmm. Over a period of three years, it works out to be twenty-one customers a day. So How many? Twenty-one customers. Twenty-one customers a day move our yeah. buy our stuff. Oh, wow. 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 So, wow. so all in all. The Cisco infrastructure and the architecture that Cisco is starting to put in place here, again, has evolved pretty quickly, to be honest with you, for in a very, very short period of time. Cisco has put a lot of uh, money where their mouth is in R&D and acquisition and this, that, and the other. So in essence, we have, uh, we've got a, uh, the B-series chassis. We have the C-series servers. What's a C series server? Does anybody know the C series? It's a, it's a standalone server, right? Again, built for virtualization and everything. But again, it's got its own power supplies. 
and, it, and again it can have a lot of different cores and all this that and the other but it's really a standalone solution now can it be managed from that fabric interconnect yes, yes absolutely can so you could actually manage more you could manage your standalone servers with virtualization as well as your blade servers all in one interface which is a pretty I think it's something different as well that Cisco does uh, again so we so we have these different servers so so let's look at kind of start from the ground up and work with some of the things that we're going to have in this and I'm going to try to draw this on the fly boy are we all in for an experience so we're going to have our servers we're going to have uh, blade servers in racks here with our fabric interconnects our fabric interconnects here we'll have multiple racks of blade servers these guys fitting in to these fabric interconnects like this like that so we're going to have racks of servers and using the fabric interconnects to manage up to 20 of these chassis each one of these having up to eight servers in it so a lot of servers a lot of density there uh, for our rack mounted servers whether they're traditional servers or other servers we're going to have to connect these guys and I'm going to put these some top of rack we're going to have to connect those in and out we're going to have the fa uh, fabric interconnects or the fabric interconnectors here the 2200 series now what they are is fan out remember we talked about uh, switches like this remember I said you have to have a supervisor which is the brains and then you have all these line cards so you've got the supervisor and the line cards well Cisco has actually had to create some virtual chassis inside of the network to be able to do deliver all of these ports that we want so what we do is on these racks we're going to put the 2200 series fabric interconnects on the top, uh, not fabric interconnects, uh, FEXs, uh, got them, they're the fabric interconnects, yeah, the fabric interconnects in here, the, so they're the 2200 series of fabric interconnects, they're actually the blades, so these guys will connect multiple servers and all this, we can put them in, if these are standalone servers, we can have them here, let's say I have standalone servers, somebody else's servers, whoever they are, our servers, rack mounted servers, whatever, we'll put some 2200s up here depending on what they need. All of these are top of rack switches. They look like top of rack switches. They're actually blades that need a supervisor. So you'll have, you know, several rows of these servers in here. And you'll have these top of rack switches, the 2200s and they all will fit to the end of row and the supervisor for all of these 2200s will be the 5500 it's the supervisor so you actually have a virtual switch with blades out here so these guys will all be interconnected to these guys like that these are the brains this is actually where all the smarts are these just are passed through they just are passed through there's an actual standard coming out for all the the tagging in, that they have in here for this I think it's B something uh, I think the limit today is 16 is it 16 16 on this yeah, and uh, on the 5500, it for uh, the 7000, these can also answer to a bigger switch, the 7000, and I think they can do 20 or 24 on a 7000, a blade on a 7000. Yeah, but in essence, what does this give us? It gives us more connectivity, and all the intelligence is here. So a lower cost. This is where the smarts are. This is where the smarts are. So think about it. We're bringing all of this all this unified fabric all the ethernet all the fiber channel everything all the way back to this guy and now this guy can actually feed it back out he can take 
fiber channel protocol and send it over to an MDS and actually into the SAN proper if you wanted to, right? Uh, you can have the Nexus, se oh, shoot. Nexus 7K up here, which will, you know, these guys will connect into the Nexus 7K. 40 gig Ethernet, whatever you want to put there. These guys will support 40 gig Ethernet back into here. So you could have several of these blocks of this over and over and over. You're cookie cutting the way you would design it, having this one module here, this one module here, this one module here. So the top of rack, end of row kind of solution that you have. These 2200s are not smart. They're not smart. And you can get those to support 100 megabit, gigabit, or 10 gigabit Ethernet, depending on which uh, flavor that you have Ethernet coming out of your servers. Yes, sir. Sorry, then you got fabric indicator in the slide. Uh huh. Do you still need a fabric extender for that? Well, that, the, the fabric, that's what that is, a fabric yeah. extender. That's what this is. Fabric, I'm sorry, fabric extender. That's what it's called. FEX, fabric so extender. So you're only using 2200s. Right. 2200s back into the 5K. Does that make, make sense? What is the fabric? The fiber interconnect can either go directly into one of these or back into this guy itself. Okay. Yeah. So you would still yeah. potentially have fabric extenders as well as Yes, fabric. absolutely. Like yeah. That. Depends on, yeah. You could have, and again, I won't do the design. Every design might be different. But if I have racks of servers here, to standalone servers and everything, I'm probably just going to have the 2200. Unless somebody still wants to use a SAN, traditional SAN and fiber channel, then I would have some fiber channel switches in here as well. And I'd only be dealing with Ethernet. I wouldn't be doing, you know, uh, unified fabric. Does that make sense? So there's a lot, again, there's a lot of different ways. There's no one data center. It looks like every other data center. Yes? So with the technology going from 1 gig to 10 gig, how soon do we see 100 gig being reality? It's actually shipping now. Right. Yeah. 40 gig is shipping in here. Right. 40 gig and 100 gigs on its way. Right. Yes, absolutely. The Nexus 7K is already ready for it. The 5K, the new 5500s are 100 gig ready. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't know where it'll end. I don't know where it'll end, but it'll be faster than 100, 100 gig, I guess, because I've lived to see that. Yeah. So that's kind of kind of how this solution would work. Now, Cisco's made some relationships. They've tore down some relationships. Uh, what do you think, you know, HP and IBM thought about Cisco when they started selling servers? Boy, did that sour a relationship. Absolutely. Cost Cisco a lot. Again, uh, Cisco entered a, uh, they've got this triangle of, of support now, or, you know, this uh, love-hate relationship with EMC and VMware. We've created these, uh, the V block. Well, so I'll show you the V block and what the V block looks like. The V block, uh, we created this organization called VCE, which is uh, VMware, Cisco, and EMC all together, where they actually can sell you one solution. It's a box that's got EMC software, uh, EMC hardware and software for storage. It's got VMware for the virtualization uh, of the servers and Cisco's uh, servers and switching capabilities. All in one, in essence, part number. <laughs> it's called a V-Block. And I'll show it to you online when we get to the product section. We've also got a uh, connection with uh, NetApp. It's called FlexPod. And in, in essence, the storage is FlexPod, VMware, and uh, Cisco infrastructure for that. And again, this, what we're selling with all this stuff, and I've been dying to get into the subject, is what, what we're selling with that one product number is a cloud. We're selling, VM virtualization has led to the real use of the cloud. It's it, for our service providers. Think about service providers. If we were just doing standalone servers, would a service provider be able to do application support for customers? Think about all the servers they'd have to have and all this, that, and the other, the different operating system. 
If we were just doing standalone service, it'd be impossible for a service provider to actually think about offering a cloud solution. But when you've got this technology now with this virtualization to, to be able to, to maximize the use of your resources, and again, if we think about service providers, they want to sell the same thing over and over, and now they can. They can sell the same physical server over and over and use it over and over with virtualization. So it's led to the cloud, the opportunity that the cloud is. It really has. So from a service provider, uh, service provider, it's helped them out to actually start developing a whole new revenue stream. A whole new revenue stream of being offering services, hosting services for customers that they probably couldn't. Oh, them doing as well. Absolutely, it's 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 not only the, the you know your service provider's name it might be a lot different than you ever thought. Oh, yeah. yeah, when we talk about HCS tomorrow, hosted collaboration solution, the providers for that are a lot. Ninety percent of them are non-traditional service providers. They're not the AT and T's, IBM's, British Telecom, all this of the world. It's the other partners who are doing it. And they're doing a very good job of it. They're doing a very good job in a lot of places. Uh, and it's a whole new revenue stream for them. And in fact, one of the biggest things about that in terms of mindset is actually what's winning that is the relationship. Not the oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It is the relationship. Yeah, exactly. The barriers to entry to that market have came down. Have came down. Used to be, if you wanted to host voice, you had to have a big class five switch and all this infrastructure and all this. You don't have to have that all anymore. We're talking about servers and applications here. So this virtualization and all the things that we've came up with are certainly, you know, Cisco's helped develop here. And I think Cisco's had an instrumental role in this. They didn't do it all themselves, but they certainly took full advantage of it has led to a lot of money coming into Cisco, that new bubble. Really nice for Cisco. And uh, it has soured relationships. Some relationships have healed back a little. Some relationships are still going to be not as happy as it used to be. I personally, uh, you know, I don't know what the numbers showed out because IBM and HP used to sell, resell a lot of Cisco stuff. And boy, you don't think they don't want to sell anything to Cisco now. And vice versa. Cisco would never, you know. It's caused a lot of grief in the industry as far as it goes with that. And some customers have actually mentioned it to me. God, I wish the Cisco, HP, and IBM thing would quit. Well, everybody's got to do their own business. Everybody's got to do their own business. So that's the data center in particular. And again, these seven Ks. The seven Ks, you know, they have an outward facing and an inward facing. We actually have two different series of cards that go in these things. You have F cards down here in the bottom that go here. So when you look at a 7K, at the cards that go in it, you'll have modules that go in here that start with an F. They point downward. That's their job. You'll have M cards. M cards f f point out. They do routing tables and all of this, that, and the other. So there will be different cards that go in these, and I'll show you that online when we get into the products. So Cisco's got a lot of things. Yes, sir? Are many people using the Nexus, you know, five and seven Ks without going to the UCS compute, or normally is it all together? Yeah, I, 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 yes. You know, there's a religion, that's a religious war, right? This is not so much a religion. This is a, a really good use case for this. When you get into servers, you, you enter a different layer of religious war. So there's, and again, for our collaboration solutions, if you think about it, we're selling a lot of servers there. When we do, we have UC on UCS. Right? On our B-series. That'd be great. But our collaboration specialists are not going to fight this war for our data center people. They'll say put it on a C-series. Customers are much more familiar with putting it on a C-series, a rack-mounted server, and, and it doesn't fight that religious war. So, yes. Yes, yes sir. Uh, why, why do we have to uh, introduce a new operating system with these switches? With, with the switches? The Nexus OS? Yeah, yes, all right. So, let's, first of all, it's not a new operating system. All right, so this operating system has been around since 2002. It was the same operation, operating system that was on the MDS 9500 that was released in December of 2002 and became the number one director class fiber channel switch in the, in the world. Uh, it's the same operating system. It's different than iOS. Now, why did we have to do it? 
The iOS has been around for a long, 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 long time. This is a Linux core with our iOS on top of it. That's all it is. What does it allow us to do? It allows us to give not only hardware redundancy, but software redundancy. Because what we can do is we can start isolating things that we do in services, services, software services, and if these individual services lock up. So let's say that I have a, a Nexus 7K up here. Part of the services they'll be running up here might be uh, BGP, a service of BGP. If that service starts here, do I want it to stop all my traffic that's going in here? Maybe not. So putting a Linux core on this allows me to do software and hardware resiliency so I can have a software restart this service in the Linux box. And if that doesn't work, I can always use this hardware of another interface, another card. So it actually gives us two types of redundancy. It gives us the ability to add other services on top of it, which iOS was designed back in the late, in the mid 90s, and it was closed, and we couldn't add any other services. So now we could actually put other people's applications in conjunction with ours and work very well. So it's really opening it up. So iOS isn't based on Linux? Or no, no, old iOS is not based on Linux. No, it's not at all. But all the new stuff is, the new Catalyst 6500 and the new 4500s, all running on Linux, Linux Core, running a Linux Core. So they're running iOS, they're running they're running iOS on a Linux server, inside of a Linux server. We've ported iOS, the capabilities of iOS, to run on a Linux-based server. But Nexus, is Nexus is the same thing. Aside. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing that goes in this, I can use every iOS command. Matter of fact, when I saw the MDS 9500 for the first time, they looked at me and said, you're an old switch routing guy. And I said, yeah. They said, "Guess can you sit down here and tell me what commands we missed? If an iOS guy can configure any of these boxes the exact same way they could do an old router back in the 90s. But, if they want, but now, if we want to have a GUI, it's much easier to have a GUI. Because it's, it's running a different version of it. Just run, they just had to change the name of it. Yeah. So, so iOS, Nexus is the operating system. I can still use all the commands of iOS and do everything I ever want to do. An old router guy like me, so, so command sets the same. The same. <laughs> just the in interface is different. So I can have a GUI interface, like people like in a data center. They certainly like GUI instead of command line. Or I could actually do command line. I have the best of both worlds. But the real reason, the under, underlying reason for that is to put it in a core where individual services don't stop other services. So I could have a, a, an operation in Linux, a thread in Linux, that's my BGP tables. And if that, that starts having issues, I can restart that service in this card, try to restart it here, and if not, go to the next card. So I have multiple redundancies. Restart it here, it doesn't work, go down here. But does that affect any of my other stuff going on over here? No, it doesn't affect it at all. I can compartmentalize. Yeah. It's, the, it's, you know, it's why don't we use COBOL and BASIC anymore? That's really it. It's the next iteration, and Cisco's moved to it. Yeah. Yes? As we're having these conversations with customers on like 6500s versus mm -hmm. Nexus 7K, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, what, do, do we care if they stay with 6500? Oh, well, I wouldn't care, but I'll be honest with you. Per port 10 gigabit, Nexus is cheaper than 6500. 6, okay. But if 10 gig is not? If 10 gig's not big to them and everything, then, 6, yeah, 6500s. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Does that make sense? I mean, I hope I've answered the address to questions and stuff. And again, Cisco just moved on. They had to with the, with the operating system. And they wanted to run it on a Linux because you can use multi multi processors now. We can have, you know, this pro this process using this processor, this process using that processor. So, kind of much more flexible for us.